Yeah, so here's another on the couch. Um, obviously, I'm wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt, but not going to do them. I'm going to do um, Led Zeppelin. Uh, pretty sure I didn't do it yet. This is the fourth rendition, edition, episode, lecture, now, whatever it is. It's the fourth one. Um, the fourth pillar. Led Zeppelin is a band that I've started to notice people are talking about it like it's this overrated phenomenon. But, you know, ten years ago, I, I feel like people talked about it as if it were so underrated as a phenomenon. So, what's the proper rating? I, it's me. I think, I still think they're kind of the best. But then, you know, you listen to other music and you're like, okay, they got stuff that Zeppelin never had for sure. And you get bored of Zeppelin. But I think I don't think there's a band where my like love affair with that band has been more significant and lasting than with Led Zeppelin, which was, you know, or about 12 years ago or something like that. 10 years. Somewhere between 10 to 12 to 13 years ago. Maybe more than Maybe almost 15 years ago was when I became like an avid Led Zeppelin fanboy. And this is someone who never got to see them live, you know, like probably most of their fans at this point anyway. So they broke up in 1980. Their drummer died. We all know the story. What are my top 10 favorite songs? Well, I I will say at least listen to their albums. I'm not someone who just appreciates the hits. Um, And to be fair, I'm probably not going to include a lot of hits on this list. Um, number 10, I gotta say, Over the Hills and Far Away. Probably the first ama- most elegant song I heard by, the, by them on an album that got me into the bands, like Squarely, which was House of the Holy. Um, I think that was the first album I just listened to, like, whole, like you know, top to bottom. And Over the Hills and Far Away really, literally, it was like t- so Tolkien esque. It transported me to, like, the Shire, and of course, you know, the Hills of Wales. In England, just it really takes you places with the um, the majesty of the sort of the hum of the humble woodland uh, chords and f- uh, finger style arpeggios. But that arpeggiation aside, you get bored of that kind of thing. And while the lyrics are cool and the vocals are very rousing, um, and of course the back end of that song is fairly energetic, you know, it's driving. I would say that it's not more than number 10. I think number 9 probably be The Rover. And this is one of the last songs I ever kind of got into from uh, Bully Physical Graffiti. But it does typify the excellent sort of um, appeal of a band like Led Zeppelin. This sort of James Bond internationalism where you kind of international man of mystery, you're a playboy, you're all over the map, you're a rover, right? The rover. And this song has a really intense um, riff that is sort of unexpected for Jimmy Page at this point in his career, I would say. And it, 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 and it feels just as vibrant and strong-headed as, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin 2 or, or 1. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking more 2, uh, like uh, Heartbreaker or A Whole Lot of Love. You know, the Rover, um, really kind of a charging riff, and it's got an excellent rhythm to it. The whole band seems to be enjoying it. For one of the later, one of the last times you really feel that they can pull off a song like this in their cataloging, if somehow it's one of the best they've ever done. Um, it's number, it's, the Rover is my number nine. Okay, uh, number eight. Well, let's say, um... By the way, this is all extemporaneous, so I, I don't I don't have a prefigured list. Um, I'd say for number eight, without missing too many beats, uh, babe, I'm gonna leave you. Probably the first song that it, 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 I, I said that over the hills and far away was like the first song I got into, which is kind of true. I think Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You might have been the first song that opened me to this idea that other people had experiences that were like mine. 
as a sort of an angsty teenager. I think it was the first song that helped helped me empathize with the world, but also with myself in a very profound way that um, was kind of like a new birth. And yet that song apparently is, you know, it's a cover song by Joan ba- from Joan Baez's work. So, I mean, the song, it's, you, you, I thought they wrote, one of the, the band members wrote it, but it was just, a, just an exceptional, brilliant cover of a Joan Baez piece. Number eight. Number seven. Um, how Many More Times. At one point, all these songs are like my favorite song, but I think I had a very long stretch with How Many More Times. Where I really felt like it was the ultimate or penultimate or just one of the very last great rock songs. Even though it was, and this is the first Zeppelin album, this is it's still 69. Um, and it, yeah, it feels like a fucking bad company anthem from the late 70s. It's just, it, it has a certain, it was ahead of its time. And it, and it still sounds very young in a fascinating kind of way. The smokiness is, um, exceeds the smokiness of Days and Confused, in my opinion, or that other great song, uh, Your Time Is Gonna Come. I think how many more times is reflective of every sort of virtuosic impulse that the, the bandmates had from the get-go, and it reflects their commitment in its early, in the earliest form to uh, a computational legacy, not just a uh, showmanship one. It's all just a hell, of a, a hell of a groove. I mean, it really flails and bangs and pounds and slashes and slams. How many more times is a heartbreak, heart rending, heart rendering? What is it? Heart wrenching? I don't know. It's it breaks your heart and then it reforms it and then breaks it again and reforms it. It's got excellent section divisions, uh, and it's a long song. It's about ten minutes, as it should be. Uh, and the lyrics are hilarious. It's probably got the funniest Zeppelin lyrics. I can th- I can recall offhand. Yeah, I would I would say so. The funniest Zeppelin lyrics. Okay, that, is that seven? I guess that's seven. Yeah, number six. Um, let's go with Led Zeppelin four because we haven't touched it yet. Um, ah, fuck it. And Led Zeppelin two. What is and what should never be. Really charging. Uh, heavy-handed, um, epic jam, uh, sorry, epic, um, anthem that, that has a sort of Christian luminance to it that makes you feel more purposeful when you hear it. I feel like What Is and What Should Never Be is a song that kind of reinvigorated my soul the first dozen or two dozen times I listened to it. Uh, classic song from Led Zeppelin II. One of the, really the definition of an underrated Zeppelin song, what is and what should never be. And it's got a brilliant gong um, appearance, you know, it, it, and, it, and the, the sort of dynamics in that song are one of a kind. I've never heard any one pull off dynamics like that with the particular rhythm that they have, but also just the um, the stark contrast. It was just, you know, peace, they was peace. De La Resistance. Um, that's number six. One of my all-time favorite songs by Led Zeppelin, and um, one of the one of the one of the most probably their most uh, neutral song in terms of it not being overly moody or suggestive or evocative. It's a very sort of middle of the road theme, which I think really complements their 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 intense driving energy on the album Led Zeppelin too. Up next, number five. Let's give it to um, something from Led Zeppelin IV. I would say the Battle of Evermore. Um, this is a as I've gotten older, I've gotten more interested in the connections that the the, the, the songwriters in Zeppelin can make to historical topics. And um, of course, the Evermore is not a real battle. It's sort of a fictitious send up of a real battle. Like, you know, the Battle of Stamford Bridge or the Battle of uh, the Boyne or the Battle of Hastings or what's the other one? The Battle of Sterling, Battle of Falkirk. You these funny battles, right? Um, especially the Midlands battles, Birmingham sort of based, you know, 
um, epic, uh, epic consequential battles, right, between rival civil war factions and, and their leaders on horseback, right? All that stuff, you know. Uh, Battle of Evermore is, a, a, they quote Lord of the Rings, sort of, or they reference it. Um, it's sort of an epic um, winding song that takes you places in the middle of the night. It feels like you're f being chased through the forest um, with nothing but the glow of the moon and your torch just to guide you down the path to Haven. Again, is that number seven or six? I think it's six, maybe five. I don't know. Um, I'll have to re recount because I might, I might be doing 11 by, uh, by accident. But Battle of Evermore is my favorite one on um, more than Black Dog, more than uh, Stairway, more than uh, uh, that, 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 that sort of onerous um, song, rap sounding song that everyone seems to um, gum up about. Uh, when the levee breaks, those are all brilliant. I mean, everything Zeppelin does is kind of brilliant. There isn't really a bad song. There's very few bad songs or sort of mid songs, as it were. None of them are really subpar. But for all the bombast, I think the Battle of Evermore is the standout song on Led Zeppelin IV. Ironically, since I think it's one of their least um, played on radio. Uh, so up after that. It kind of winds down a little. I think uh, Thank You is probably number five. Assuming I'm not in the fourth place, I'm in the fifth. I would say Thank You. Um, because it's the, it's their most tender song. It's their most uh, uplifting. It's their most um, sort of coy but it's also their most revealing. The lyrics themselves, it's a romantic song. The lyrics are almost meaningless. They're so vague, but at the same time, they're very, very confident and bold and unashamed. And it's this mercurial kind of um, status that the band members have as, as paramours that creates this sort of vibe with a song like Thank You where you really don't know who it's written about. And you don't care. You start. You just kind of feel like a superhero when you hear it. Like you wrote the song, and in some sense, maybe the song is also written for you. And that it's it's a larger than life love song. It's it's a love, the kind of love song that no one really deserves, but we got anyway. Number four. Um, Tangerine. I feel like this is a song somewhat like Thank You. It's a love song, but it's a little bit more uh, plangent, a little more frayed, and a little more uh, nostalgic, lingering, haunting. This is uh, really, it's a song written by Jimmy Page that sort of typifies... His obsession with with uh, loves that could not really work out very well, um, and um, obviously Robert does the same thing. But when Jimmy does it, it's it's more obscure in its um, focus, and that's the kind of thing that really kind of um, captivates my attention. Uh, it's also one of the first songs I ever really wanted to perform live as a musician myself, um, and I think Tangerine kind of reflects this pastoral tradition of uh, sort of raiding and raping and pillaging that isn't embodied by Led Zeppelin, but it's sort of um, appreciated by them. And the masculinity in that, in, in implied therein is sort of emboldens youth like myself, who at like 16, 15, didn't really have a lot of guidance and needed some kind of toxic masculinity but at the same time it's sort of a joke it's sort of not really it, 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 it it's the kind of song where you realize that being macho is more about forcing yourself into a position of leadership rather than about assuming that leadership is granted to you 
when it isn't. And despite Tangerine being a song that's very like, um, sorry, I got a message. Despite Tangerine being a song that's very fey, and uh, maybe some sometimes um, circuitous, predictable, I think it's a song that reflects sort of the rhythms, emotions of my own heart, as they always have been and always will be. It's a song that kind of is, is it, it mirrors me in this sort of immortal way, and you could I could listen to that song any day of my life, and I would I would feel like I that song was written for me, almost completely, absolutely. So that's why it's a little bit better in my head than um, "Thank You," but they're both kind of neck and neck. Okay, number is that number three? I don't know. I think it was four. So number three would be. Ten Years Gone. This is, I think, the most beautiful love song I've ever heard. I like it more than Since I've Been Loving You, and I appreciate that song. I've gotten a little tired on it, but I've always appreciated that song. I've always adored it. Ten Years Gone, to me, is a song that really is tragedy incarnate. It is a song that transmogrifies and apotheosizes tragedy from a playwriting form, a playwritten form, to one that is more immediate, more in your face, more crystallized. And that is um, the, the, the magic of you know recording song, of a recorded song. Uh, Ten Years Gone is, is so relatable to me that it, it's embarrassing. It's, it's a song about regret and more than tangerine or thank you which are like the last two songs i mentioned this song encapsulates uh regret and possibly even unrequited love in in a way that is it just pinches my heart and it uh it's it it, it scares me terrifying it's a terrifying song number two is that what? Yeah, number two. Um, I think honestly, um, I've listened to this song so many times. I don't know if I could really give it this ranking, but I just know that I've loved. I used to love it, um, and that is a whole lot of love. Um, when I realized this song was depicting like a human orgasm. With the the mid the the, the 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 kind of the back end, I my ideas about what music could be like fucking multiplied in 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 a way that hasn't really happened since. Um, a very eye opening song and a very uh, uh, appealing song because it really reminds you of who you are as at the kind of the satanic level. Let's be honest, but in that good kind of satanic level. Really, it's it's a temptational song, and it's their most sort of sultry, their most sort of on the nose song for sure. But it's also got the best riff, or sorry, it's got the best rock riff ever written. And so I I, I can't really deny it its place. It's a number two song for me. Uh, I still love I love hearing it when I hear it on stores or. In, TV or radio. I, anytime I hear that song, I just, I'm like, I, like I swoon for it. It's a, such such a powerful song, and it's a song that almost isn't really a song. It's it's sort of an anthem for rock music itself, which is uh, transcendent. Uh, do, 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 do. Number one, my number one favorite Zeppelin song. It's tough. Um, I was gonna, I got, I, I was gonna say Down by the Seaside, because it's just such an elegant song about grace and, and patience and be- natural beauty, a little bit of artificial beauty, because it talks about boats, but overall it's just a scenic, sort of, somewhat pastoral, very, you know, pl- painting in plein air song. But I think that's more of an honorable mention, really. 
You know, it'd be it wouldn't be the coup de gras that um, the, the re my real answer is, which is uh, all my love. All my love. You, you know, it's not as famous as Days of Confused or Good Times, Bad Times or Rock and Roll, Heartbreaker. I mean, but all my love. Uh, or Fool in the Rain, you know, which is the same album. But All My Love, I think it is, Into the Outdoor. But All My Love is a song that's so crushing in its honesty, so brutally, crushingly honest and poignant and sorrowful and um, painful. You listen to that song, you don't even think this guy's a rock star. You think that this guy's just been weather beaten. And you feel like you're the you're lucky. You feel like you're the lucky one. Um, and that's you know there are some artists that can do that, but with this song, the the whole composition is has so much mutual sort of collaboration and it's sort of uh, gestalt that you really feel like that this is a crystallized experience for almost for more people than just Robert, but for who sing who who write, who wrote the song, but for about his son who died. But it's a, it's a song about sort of the entirety of human connection, um, which is maybe like maybe kind of a crazy thing to say. But that song really tries to get to the core of human experience as a universal, very platonic. And uh, I just can't think of a song that's better in Led Zeppelin, but also maybe in Anywhere. The only song I think that later, year, I mean, not to compare too wildly, but the only song that's maybe got me in this, it puts me in the same place, is The Cure's Pictures for You. Especially, because I've listened to that song probably just as many times. And I think those two songs, All My Love by Led Zeppelin and Pictures of You, are very, very much at the top of my music lists. And... They are both songs about regret, about remembering, about love's failed potential, about memories that are impossible to regain, and they're and they're about honesty and vulnerability. <sighs> and I just I get, I kind of choke up thinking about these things. So there you have it, my top 10 Led Zeppelin songs of 23 minutes, usually try to stay to 20, but for a band like Zep, Led Zepp, you know, you really can't do just 20 minutes. Fuck, I could have done all day if I had to. All right. <laughs> Peace out, cheers, toodaloo. Um, I'll catch you next time for another On the Couch. Thinking of doing a Sabbath, maybe... Grateful Dead, because I have the shirt. Steely Dan was also one, but I, I think I'll write an essay on them instead. They're not really a band I want to just, you know, shout shout out to on, on a video so much. I'm not a huge fan. I'm just a moderate fan of theirs. And then another one um, that I might end up doing uh, before we get to 24 minutes, I should just say it quickly. What was it? Do do do. What was it? Um... So oh, I didn't recap the songs. Okay, let me recap the songs. We'll probably end up with 25 minutes. Um, it was in backwards order. All My Love. Ten Years Gone? No, Whole Lot of Love. T then Ten Years Gone. Then Tangerine. Then Thank You. And by the way, Tangerine and Thank You are sort of interchangeable to me. I mean, but yeah, yeah, yeah. let's just keep the order. It was Tangerine. Thank you. Um, this top five. Then it was Battle of Evermore. Then it was um, what is what is, what is and what should never be. Then I think it was those could have been reversed. I don't remember. Or those could have been a different order. But yeah, and then it was um, for sure. Uh, Oh, you know, another song that's cool, but I don't, it's still more of an honorable mention, is In the Light. That and That's the Way. Two really haunting, deep, spooky kind of songs that 
sort of uplifting despite their clear darkness in their origin. Um, very cryptic and uh, intriguing. Um, but yeah, so we got to five, and then it was Battle of Evermore, uh, Ten Years Gone. How many more times? Uh, 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 the other one, the, I, it was one of the first ones I ever played guitar. I learned a guitar on the guitar was, a uh, uh, Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You. And I think the, the top of the, the number 10 was, um, Over the Hills and Far Away. Um, and I also really like Jeer Maker on the House of the Holy album. But that one might have made the list instead of Over the Hills and Far Away. Those are kind of neck and neck. I mean, obviously, No Quarter is pretty cool, too. But Jeer Maker and Over the Hills and Far Away were both my favorites on the House of the Holy album. And that's, it's, it's a fine album, but those two songs I felt like were just next level compared to everything else on, on that album. No Quarter even was a little bit worse, in my view. Because House of the Holy wasn't the best album. It was... They're very they're one of their more experimental albums, but it wasn't their most cohesive. Anyway, so um, in the next, we're 27 minutes, definitely over time. Um, I should put the list in the description, quite honestly, but I won't, because I want you to watch the video. <laughs> next up, I think I'll do, um, I could probably even do it right after this, is uh, Black Sabbath. But, uh, or Rolling Stones, oh, I did Rolling Stones as well. That's the other one I did. I did so. This is the f fourth one, yeah. And then Deep Purple, Black Sabbath. I'm gonna do Frank Zappa. I'm gonna do for sure. Pink Floyd. I guess I would have to. Um, kind of obvious that one. Um, like what's on the menu? You know, uh, that's the that's the real question, right? Um, am I running out of bands? I don't know. I mean, I did the Saxon with Michael A, so maybe I could do the tier ranking, so maybe I could do one on their songs. I don't know. Um, what is there? What is there to do? Uh, the Cure, for sure. So I sort of, I alluded to them earlier. I could do their top ten. I could do. Uh, why am I blanking on some stuff? I could do. Guns. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of bands that were just like you don't even know if you want to talk about their top ten songs. I could do Chicago, for sure. I could. Do all, oh, that's what it was. I wanted to do Allman Brothers Band. That's what it was because. Um, They've been a huge influence on my sort of perspective for musicianship. I've always considered them to be kind of the, the most professional sort of rock outfit in terms of the way they went, not in the years up until Greg died, but mostly in their foundational years. As a formation, I just felt like they were like a, such a powerhouse in, in terms of making rock music seem more legitimate. Like it can, it can, like rock could incorporate American rock music could incorporate so many different um, other genres into its sort of blend, the premium blend that Southern rock became. Uh, so Almond Brothers Band is um, it's also one of the few bands that my dad introduced me to. Um, he like really he really like put in the effort to like show me because he used to, he grew up with it, uh, and um, if I do the Almond Brothers, I'll probably do something like. You know, the music of Eric Clapton, like everything that he's been involved with, because really he's, he transcends more than just Cream or his solo work. He's also got different kinds of stuff. Um, Blind Faith, you know, Derek and the Dominoes, uh, whatever, all that. Uh, Delaney and Bonnie, you know, the Yardbirds, John Mayall. He was in a lot of outfits, actually. A lot of people are only dimly aware of that. Um... Chicago, yeah, the big four I always like to sort of talk about as if they were just institutions unto themselves. And, and I kind of intend to write a book about them someday. So they're definitely being the top 20 in this series upcoming is Chicago, 
uh, Allman Brothers Band, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention, and the Grateful Dead. Those are kind of the four corners of rock music in America. But the other, there's some other bands that kind of can do that sort of thing in an alternative vein, like Blue Oyster Cult or Van Halen or the Eagles, maybe. You know, there's other stuff that's, they're kind of doing the same thing, but I just don't find them as captivating as an institution, even if they have an epic catalog of hits. Like Journey, you know, has a lot of hits. Um, well, maybe not so much. Maybe maybe a lot of platinum albums, but not so much hits properly. Um, Judas Priest and Iron Maiden are going to be up, up here um, just to take care of business. Um, I still have food. I, have some, I ate chips a second ago, so maybe I had chips this whole time. I like these sheets, these white sheets, make me look like I'm hanging out in heaven. 31 minutes. Damn, this is this is a lot for just a top 20. Um, the good news is the first 22 minutes, you got most of the Zeppelin in. So that's two minutes a song, almost. Two minutes and what, like five seconds per song. Anyway, um, two minutes and three and a half seconds per song. No, I... Maybe Grand Funk Railroad. Maybe Scorpions. Scorpions would be a big one. Um, you know, for all these classic bands, Mountain would be good. Pat Travers Band. I could even try something like Budgie or Fog Hat or Wishbone Ash or um, you know Skinnerd. I don't know, any, any kind of thing like that. Oh, another one I really have to do is Neil Young because I'm a huge fan of his body of work. And his style just, you know, across the board is one of the best singer-songwriting stylists. And also one of the best sort of, um, whatever his folk rock stylists, I don't really know what his genre would be. He's Canadian, it's all kind of confusing. Canadians confuse me. If you couldn't tell. Um, so anyway, we'll just leave it there. Um... Can't, nothing else is springing to mind in the terms of, you know, like a rock band. Um, there's obviously a lot of 80s bands that we could kind of pretend to have, like, you know, a, this major fan complex for. But really, like, how many Poison songs are, am I going to have a top ten list that I can make that would that would be meaningful? Or how many, like, you know... Triumph songs, or you know, not really. Even in the seventies, you have stuff like that, like Vanilla Fudge and Ted Nugent, and you know, just kind of weird, like dad rock music. That's like, it's like not really like classic, but it's sort of like fun. you can you have fond memories just because you, you knew someone older who who liked it. Um, but then again, I don't know. Maybe that's everything. I think Blue Oyster Cult and Bad Company could be good candidates because they have a lot of albums but they both have a lot of albums and they're kind of like they're kind of cool bands despite being you know really old bands at this point they're still kind of cool they're, they have this veneer of sort of coyness so those would be good and then I think the big four I mentioned um, Chicago Grateful Dead Almond Brothers and uh uh Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. And so that's six upcoming. And then we also have the British stuff like Sabbath, Deep Purple, um, which I don't think we've done, but we did Uriah Heap and UFO, so that's pretty good. And we also have the one German band, Scorpions. Um, it's probably the only like really non-English band. Even though it's English, but it's the one that they, 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 they're not from an English-speaking country. Probably the only one. Um... Van Halen, I guess. I mean, I guess that's easy easy enough to come up with 10 brilliant songs by Van Halen, so why not? Um, Neil Young, okay, Canadian, so that's the other one that's not from. Oh, no, they speak English there. Never mind. Okay, this is, this is going really long and really far in the paint. I just... 
trying to get this like complete list of lists figured out. Um, not a lot of Mexican bands. The Eagles could work. Oh, Pink Floyd. Yeah, some British stuff from back in the middle of the day. Like Proko Harum, Moody Blues. That could be worth looking into. The Kinks. Donna. Uh, that, yeah. Well, then you can get into singer-songwriter stuff. Which I'm kind of reserving for when I'm like doing an outside video. The inside videos, for um, inexplicable reasons, are going to be about classic rock bands. And the outdoor videos are going to be in the gardens and on the, in the parks. On the by the street, whatever, all those are going to be more singer songwriter, soft rock, you know, um, underhanded kind of groups. Over the over the top, overhanded groups are going to be for the on the couch series. So this is sort of my uh, my town hall meeting for you fans, in case you want, were wondering where this series is headed. Um, I did double time for it just for you. Um, and of course, I topped it off. I I, I, I came. I, I shot into it strong with the Led Zeppelin song list, but then I'm sort of topping it off with a bunch of palaver about, you know, logistics. I really I really didn't bother to trim the fat out of this one, or trim my beard, or trim really anything. Um, trim the trim the trim the trim the uh, the, uh, the clip. And clip it. Anyway, um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, the Eric Clapton one could be good. I could do one associated with guitars. Jeff Beck, that's another one, would be great. The Jeff Beck group or anything really found, founded by Jeff Beck. And then I could do Vanilla Fudge. Why not? Vanilla Fudge be fun. Cream would be kind of fun. Although, yeah, I could vanilla fudge and cream because they just sound like the same thing. Hendrix would be kind of interesting. And if I do Hendrix, I may as well do Captain Beefheart or Gil Scott Heron or someone in a similar sort of fashion. Uh, the Doors is also kind of like Hendrix. We could do him. Did I do that yet? Did I do The Doors? I feel like I, I, I must have done them. But I, I was planning to. I know that much. <sighs> Yeah, so we did, uh, oh, of course, Beach Boys and the Beatles. Um, those are easy. So, yeah, I could do those. All right, so we got at least 10. Probably more like 14 to 16 that I can do in the next, you know, few months. To I mean, really, I should be able to do it within three months, all of those. If I don't, then maybe, maybe I became a missing person or something, and you should call the police. Uh, but I, and, I, and I probably won't do one for the police because I just don't listen to their music that often. Okay, well, we did double time, so cheers to Lou. Ta ta for now. Thank you for watching these videos. Um, you're like the only person who does, so God bless.